The Buddha once described right concentration as the heart of the path. And the other seven factors were its attendance, its requisites. In other words, right view, right resolve, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right mindfulness, right effort. These are the things that help make right concentration right. So it's right that we focus on the concentration practice as the, the centerpiece of our practice. But we have to remember, too, that there are the other factors. And on the first level of right view, the teaching on karma. The principle that our actions are what shape our experience. And so we want to create the proper context, the proper environment for our practice. You have to remember, it's our actions, our resolves, our words, our, our deeds, our way of making our livelihood that have the biggest impact on the, our meditative environment. Learn to look at what other people say as the result of your past actions, what other people do, the result of your past actions. In other words, the karma you've done in the past is coming back at you. It's a sobering thought to think that your past actions were done with the desire for happiness, and now you're experiencing the skillfulness or lack of skillfulness in your past actions, in your past desires for happiness, your past efforts to bring about happiness. When you have that attitude, it's a lot easier to live with other people. If they do something outrageous, you realize, well, you were probably a real character sometime in the past. And let it go at that. What your focus should be now is what you're doing and saying and thinking in the present moment. That's why we have right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort as parts of the path. And the various factors reinforce one another. In other words, the context you create for your meditation through your actions and your words has an effect on the meditation, and the meditation should turn around and have an effect on your words and your deeds, too. If they're mutually reinforcing, then the path progresses. If they're working at cross-purposes, then you have a problem. As we mentioned today, when you, when you speak, Ask yourself first, is this really necessary? Because of all the forms of wrong speech, idle chatter seems to be the most difficult to overcome. And yet it also provides fertile ground for other kinds of wrong speech to come up as well. Because idle chatter is basically speech that doesn't really have any purpose. You just open the mouth and whatever comes out, comes out. And if you're not careful, you start coloring the truth a little bit and you start saying things that you really shouldn't have said. And so one of the first steps in the practice is to be very careful about what you say, very deliberate in what you say. Have a purpose when you open your mouth. Same principle with right action. Look at your actions to see where you're harming yourself, harming other people. Check out your livelihood. And then also look at right effort. This is one of the parts of the path that tends to get overlooked. It's basically keeping watch over what's going through your mind, the qualities that are coming up in your mind, whether they're skillful or unskillful. And this is where desire plays an important part in the practice. You want to desire, you want to have the desire, and to stick to the desire, to get rid of any unskillful qualities that have arisen and to prevent future unskillful qualities from arising in your mind. And sometimes this requires simply watching. When an unskillful thought comes in, just watch it come, watch it stay for a while, watch it go. If you can learn not how to get involved with it, that often takes care of it right there. 
It's like someone coming in and offering you something for sale. If you don't buy, they go away. Or if someone with really juicy gossip comes in and you show that you're not interested, they'll go away and they want to gossip with somebody else. They'll leave you alone. Other times, though, it requires more active involvement in order to get rid of unskillful thinking, especially the kind that just keeps coming back, coming back, coming back. The Buddha lists a few ways of dealing with unskillful thoughts. One is just very purposely directing your thoughts back to the meditation. Another is looking at the drawbacks of those unskillful thinking. If you sat here and thought about that kind of stuff for 24 hours, where would it leave you? And oftentimes you can. It's the old movies that keep coming back again and again. You've seen the old movies. You know what Humphrey Bogart's going to say. Except that in your thoughts, it's not Humphrey Bogart. Look at the thoughts coming through your mind. If there were movies, would you buy? Would you pay money to watch these movies? Would you get videos so you could see them again and again whenever you wanted? You begin to see the drawbacks of that kind of thinking. It's, it's easier to let go, because you know where the, many of these thoughts are going to go, and so you don't have to follow them. And another way is just to consciously ignore them. You know that that kind of thinking is there in the background of your mind, but you can focus your attention someplace else. Let it continue chattering as long as it wants. Because you don't have to get involved. It's like dealing with the chattering of people that you don't want to get involved with. Simply, it's maybe in your mind, but remember, it's just the results of old past actions, whether it's other people chattering or this chattering that's going on in your mind. You just learn not to get involved. It's like a stray dog coming up and asking for food. You know if you feed the stray dog, it's going to hang around and you don't want it may sound cruel, but after all, these are just thoughts. If they starve, they're not going to be suffering. You're the one who's going to suffer if you take them on. Then there's the other, another technique the Buddha recommends is relaxing the, the fabrication of thought. This applies to cases when you're sensitive enough to the breath energy in the body that you can tell. When a thought arises, there's a certain part of the body that will tense up, that the thought is actually related to that tension in that particular part of the body, whether it's in the heart or in the arm or in the leg. There's a location for the thought. You just breathe through that pattern of tension and the thought goes away. The fifth way of dealing with thoughts when they come in and you don't want them. If none of the other ones work, that's when you grit your teeth, press your tongue against the palate of your mouth, and just say, I will not think that thought. If you want, you can use a meditation word to kind of blast it out, think buto, 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 very fast. Jam the circuits. This is the crudest of the techniques, and a lot of people don't like it, but Sometimes it's the only thing that works. It'll work for a while, and then when the thought's gone away, then you can step back and try one of the four other approaches. That's how you deal with unskillful thoughts. But right effort also deals with fostering and strengthening skillful qualities as well. Mindfulness. The ability to recognize what's skillful and unskillful, persistence, rapture, serenity, concentration, equanimity. When these things arise in the mind, you want to encourage them. And whether it's through thinking or not thinking, sometimes you think that meditation is not thinking, but sometimes you need to think in ways that encourage skillful qualities in the mind. This is why the Buddha has that whole list of Recollections, recollection of the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, 
your own past generosity, your own past virtue. You can recollect death when you're getting lazy. Recollect the Buddha when you're getting discouraged. Recollect the Sangha, again, when you're getting discouraged. And you remember all the people who've trod this path in the past. People with lots more problems than you're having right now, and yet they were able to get their act together. They can do it, you can do it. Whatever way of thinking is necessary to get the mind in the right mood and the right attitude for meditating, to spark that desire to work on more skillful qualities, that all counts as part of the meditation. So remember, it's a whole set of qualities to bring the mind to a mindful state here in the present moment where you're concentrated with an element of ease, rapture, pleasure. So that you then are in the right mood to heighten the right view. In other words, bring it up from simply a belief in karma to looking in at precisely what you're doing right now that's causing stress and suffering right now. The mind is still enough to see these things. It's well nourished with that sense of ease and rapture, refreshment, that it doesn't feel threatened by the idea of looking in at your own stupidity, because that's a lot of what insight is all about, seeing the foolish ways you've been dealing with things in the past. Foolish ways you're dealing with things right now, and seeing that you don't have to do it. There are alternatives. You undercut the causes, which come down basically to craving and ignorance, and that particular type of stress you've been causing yourself just goes away. And of course, that strengthens the other factors of the path. When the mind is concentrated, it's easier to be more careful about your speech and your actions. When you understand how you're causing stress and suffering, it's easier to get the mind still. All the different elements in the path work together, so you can't do just mindfulness practice. That old attitude of all you need is mindfulness doesn't really work. There are lots of factors working together, because after all, the mind's problems are many-faceted, multifaceted, so you need a path that's multifaceted as well. This is what's meant by making your whole life to practice. I mean, you bring it in line with the fact eight factors of the path. But what is your life besides what you do and what you say and what you think? As for the things that are coming in outside, that's the result of past actions. But the actual practice, the actual environment you're creating, if you have the right attitude toward what's coming into you, you can make a good place to practice out of anywhere. So you focus on your thoughts, your words, your deeds. Those are the important elements in your life, and those are the important elements in the practice. And as for everything else, you let it pass. If there are things you can do within the boundaries of right speech or right action, you go ahead and you do them. Anything that lies outside of that, you don't want to touch. It focuses your responsibility where you really can make a difference and takes you off the hook for a lot of things you really can't make a difference. So often we get upset about things we can't control, which means that we're ignoring the things we can control. And when you feel 
focus on keeping your thoughts, words, and deeds in line with the path. Your world is a better place to live. The world of the people around you is a better place for them to live as well. John Swat used to say that everyone in the world has only one person. In other words, you're responsible for your actions. Other people are responsible for theirs. If each person thought this way and really was responsible for his or her own actions, this would be a lot better world. We can't wait for other people to do it first. You've got to start. And you can't control the, the extent to which other people will pick up on your example, but you know at least that you're putting a good example out there for anyone who's interested. That's all a human being can do.